Thank you. Um, because if we don't understand who and how exactly the atrocities are committed in Xinjiang, we don't really understand what the atrocities are in Xinjiang. We only ever hear about what has happened to the victims. We only ever happen, you know, we only ever compare what's happening in Xinjiang, the outcomes with, you know, what happened in Nazi Germany. But what is, what's happening in Xinjiang is ongoing. What we need is to assess an ongoing thing. And instead of comparing the outcomes with something that's happened in the past, that's terrible. So we need to look at the process and how it's being done currently. And that's in the form of a mass political campaign. So what did, um, you, yeah, so what did you learn and what have you come to understand about who was behind it and why that's important in terms of an ongoing campaign? And who's behind it? You know, commonly, I think before we really looked into it this time, it's un understood to be President Xi Jinping. It's understood to be um, Xinjiang Party, um, the new Xinjiang Party, the new Xinjiang Party Committee Secretary Chen Chuan Guo since 2016. It's understood to be, you know, very few men sitting in back rooms, but that's not the case. The case is, it's a people's war. It's it's a mass political campaign, meaning everyone is mobilized. Every official there is, every civilian there is, people are pitted against each other to fight these shadowy enemies known as the three evil forces. Um, so that's what's going on and that's been normalized. And, and to your point, it's even down to neighbors listening in on other neighbours, reporting on them, it's a, it's a terrible way to be building any form of community. Yes. Um, so this has happened before. You know, now, right now in Xinjiang, the neighbourhoods are ruled by what's called a trinity mechanism made up with um, a neighbourhood committee, which is a bunch of party officials. Um, a, pol a police substation. Every community residential neighborhood has their own police substation, which has one officer who lives there and three um, assistant officers. And then there are external cadres sent down to supervise and surveil the neighborhood committee. So you have this trinity mechanism that just rules over the neighborhood. And they rule over how people dress, what they do, the tidiness of their homes, um, about everything that they do, um, and organize these political theater. Last time this happened, it was in 1968, when China was in the middle of the Cultural Revolution, and when there was a revolutionary neighborhood committee that ruled people in such a way. So when it compares, say, for example, you mentioned Nazi Germany or other examples of genocide over the years, that was almost kind of an end game. This is just an ongoing game. So what impact is it having? Um, so in 2017, the Xinjiang Party Committee started to circulate this slogan amid the officials, which is that they would achieve, a part of it is that they would achieve a perfect state of stability in Xinjiang within five years. Um, and this perfect state of stability means, comprehensive stability means, you know, all of these measures from, um, you know, surveilling and indoctrinating people in their homes or, you know, an overabundance of police force, all of that being normalized, become, you know, everything is calm and stable. And that's now, that's, by the end of 2021. And now we're seeing, you know, a bunch of camps has been decommissioned. Um, some of them are slowly going away, but, you know, a lot of long prison sentences have been handed out to people. A lot of people are waiting in prison um, and that system has been less challenged internationally. And we're seeing some kind of no more C coming back, but not really, because all of these mechanisms that's been put in during the campaigns have not gone. The neighborhoods are still securitized in such a way, um, and everything has been normalized. In a way, do you feel people living in Xinjiang have just come to accept this is their way of life? Not necessarily that they have been re-educated to accept what the Chinese Communist Party wants. 
Exactly. Because the fear of detention, you know, the mass detention campaigns, they don't have to go on forever. Mass detention campaigns means everybody knows someone who's been detained. Everybody deeply fears of that. So as long as this fear still hands over people's head, it's almost as good as locking everyone up. Does it come from people who themselves went through experiences of re-education, of control? Um, that's an interesting one that we hope more research can be done on. Um, we did find that, you know, these mass political campaigns and the trauma that they generate, um, it, it just seems to keep coming back. And, you know, political scientists argue that the Communist Party has a need or it feels that it's justified to keep doing this kind of campaigns as a form of almost self-cleansing, almost, you know, always correcting what they think has gone wrong. Um, but this sort of reoccurring campaigns, what it has actually produced is so many generations of trauma. You know, Xi Jinping's own family suffered imprisonment, torture, um, re-education himself was re-educated. And, uh, you know, Xi Jinping has previously said he wouldn't want to do campaigns. Um, uh, but, but now he has approved of Xinjiang's campaigns and the same goes for some other Xinjiang officials. Yeah, it, it's, so, it's sort of yeah. it's self perpetuating, isn't it? It's, it's really quite tragic. Interesting to hear about your research. Thanks so much. Thank you, Bev.